like to bring up our tremendous panel. First of all, the screenwriter and director, Paul Berkman. <laughs> the uh, 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 film uh, uh, producer, John Avnet. stars of the movie. First, the uh, female uh, uh, lead, Rebecca De Mornay. Curtis Armstrong. A Bronson Pinchot. And Raphael Sparge. I'll start with Paul and um, tell us a little bit about the inspiration behind the movie, what uh, gave you the idea for it, and uh, did people, th I, it's hard to put ourselves back into that time, but was it an easy movie to sell or did people think you were crazy? No, it was not easy to get made. We were turned down everywhere with this particular film, which is a whole saga in itself. <laughs> I just want to say one thing. Um, in 1972, I think it was, I had come out of college with a student film, it was a 35 millimeter film, uh, called The Young Man's Romance, and I was trying to get work based on the film, which was not too successful. But I did get um, uh, a theater operator to um, show it in one of his theaters with a film called The Heartbreak Kid. They showed, it was a 20 minute short that I made, and The Heartbreak Kid was an Elaine May film. Um, and uh, so he was kind enough to show it in his theater with the heartbreak kid, which was very exciting to us. So we invited all our friends and we piled into the theater and we had one print because it was 35 and all our money was in that one print. And we're high-fiving each other because we're finally in the theaters and the film starts and it starts to jitter and then it stops and then it starts to burn. <laughs> <laughs> And we raced up to the projectionist and burst in there and the film was un, like un, unspooled on the ground and we were screaming at him and he was terrified. And uh, we finally got it back on the reels and we started it again and, and they showed the film. And I only mentioned that because the exhibitor that was kind enough to show the film was Carl Lemley. Oh. And it was in this theater. Oh. It was great for you. Yeah. 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 So, um, the circle of life people, you know, <laughs> pretty amazing, yeah. Right. So, did I answer your question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Our, our yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I'll just tell briefly, I had a deal at uh, Warner Brothers to write and direct a film because they wanted me as a writer, they didn't want me as a director. Um, and I wrote the film there, and then they saw it and they didn't want to make it. So they put it into turnaround. Meanwhile, I brought John on board because I needed a producer to talk to, I needed someone to talk to. Um, and uh, we figured, you know, these are idiots, they don't know what they're doing. We know people around town, you know, we were around town. We'll just take it someplace else, they lose, right? So we took it everywhere. <laughs> And we were turned down everywhere. 
everywhere. And we were like writing on fumes. We thought it was over when a friend of ours got it to David Geffen, who was just starting his company. Um, and this was the first film that Geffen did. And Geffen was kind of a maverick. Second film, Personal Breath. Was that for the Geffen Company or for Warner's? It was Geffen Company. Okay. Well, it was early on. And uh, Geffen was the kind of guy, you know, we I had lunch with him and he said, let's do it. And, and the irony of that is his deal was with Warner's distribution. So after we made the film, it came back to Warner's. Right. Right. Who had turned it down. Uh, who had turned it down. And they still didn't know what to do with it, really. <laughs> uh, you know, it was, um, it had to find its own audience. Well, it did. John, yeah, say a little bit about um, what uh, yes, yes, yes. sort of drew you to the project to begin with, and what do you think accounts for its enduring appeal? Well, I had uh, I met Paul because I was doing a movie that <coughs> makes unremarkable seem like a positive adjective. Uh, <laughs> and, and I called Paul because I had read stuff that he had written and said, can you uh, rewrite this? And he said, how long do you have? I said, two weeks. He said, I couldn't rewrite this in two years. <laughs> and I thought, I like this guy. <laughs> and then uh, we had lunch and he talked about the, the project, the Risky Business Project. And then uh, he, he started working on it at Warner Brothers. He called me about eight months later uh, to uh, work on the script with him, or to basically encourage him to finish the script. Would that be accurate, Paul? Yeah, you get sick of your own work and nothing's amusing anymore and you need someone to say, no, that's good. You know, he he got it. sick of some really good stuff. <laughs> and I was wise enough to say, this is good. Anyway, he finished it and we did think we had something great. It was certainly much better than anything I'd ever had. And uh, so I was uh, very bullish on it. And also, uh, as we worked together, we talked a lot about films and the films that were interested to him and interesting to, to me, and a number of them showed in this theater as well, uh, and particularly The Conformist and, uh, and The Graduate, uh, were two, uh, two kind of thought pieces, if you will. And uh, so yeah, no one wanted to do it. Uh, the executive at Warner Brothers, who Paul had to deal with, loved it, thought it was hysterical, and he was told by his bosses, who were wonderful people, Bob Daly and Terry Simmel, it wasn't as funny as he thought it was. <laughs> and then as Paul mentioned, David brought it back to Warner's and jumping forward, <clears throat> the way the clock goes in our business, uh, the film obviously was very successful. And the first big article on Bob Daly and Terry Samuel in the New York Times was entitled Risky Business. <clears throat> How they had conquered uh, the business with this film. So there was a little bit of, of irony going on there. Uh, but the thing with Geffen was that David had you know, responded to the script and promised Paul that he, Paul, could make his movie. And, uh, and the people who you see up here on this stage uh, are a direct result of that because Paul and I spent, I don't know, eight months with Nancy Klopper, you know, working on the casting, and we, we, we believe we came up with a great cast, and, and I think history has said, look at, look at these actors. <laughs> And there's a certain singularity to, to their performances here, but it was by no means uh, the end of their career. It was the beginning of so many, many wonderful, yes. wonderful roles. Yes, uh, uh, the first movie for many of them. I just read an in, in, interview today with Rebecca talking about, um, you know, <laughs> how you got the part. Maybe you can say something about it. You were completely unknown, and uh, how did the process uh, come to you? And uh, actually, was it a long auditioning uh, series, and uh, how did you and Paul finally and John uh, work things out? Uh, is it on? Yes. Is that yes. on? Okay, I'll talk into it. Um, I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> God, this was such a, uh, an incredible, incredible experience, Mike. Yeah, oh my God, my very first film. Um, yeah, so I read the script, it was on my friend's couch, and I knew that the part was exactly mine, although I had never done anything in this business, I'd studied, but I was very confident, uh, based on nothing, really. Um, but uh, I really wanted
wanted this part, and my friend, Harry Dean, um, was talking about being the, the killer pimp, Guido, Guido the killer pimp, but he mentioned my name, I believe, to John and Paul, and they'd also heard my name mentioned by my agent that I was somehow able to get, even though I hadn't done anything, um, <laughs> who mentioned my name also. So they said, uh, when Harry Dean mentioned my name, wait, we've heard this name twice. <laughs> and like, who the hell is this girl? So, so then I, I came in, and I believe I came in at the very end of your casting process. Yep. I was either the last person or one of the very last. Yep. And I came in, and I just will literally never remember, uh, never forget um, the experience of auditioning. I just felt the room, I felt the character, I felt, I, I just felt this is gonna be my part. I really did. And um, however, they needed, um, they needed me to audition a few, several times, uh, including a 6 a.m. screen test with Tom, um, which I got up at three in the morning, I remember, to get all my makeup on and, <laughs> get there and Tom had flown in from Tulsa where he was shooting um, The Outsiders and we met at 6 a.m. At, at Steve Tisch's house, the one of the producers, Steve Tisch's house and I remember Tom walking in and I saw this kid, he looked very kind of scruffy and, and stumbly. Kind of greasy, yeah, just kind of, and you know, I thought he's perfect for the kid. He looked very kind of, <sighs> like unconfident actually <laughs> and and I said to him listen I don't know if I told you guys that but I said I whispered in his ear listen this is a chemistry test <laughs> so, so we've got to get some chemistry going now <laughs> I literally said that to him and and he just kind of looks at me like what, <laughs> what? and and we did this test together and I just it was just such a a magical thing that I just always felt so connected to it and then afterwards I got a phone call in my little apartment in West Hollywood I picked up the phone and it was Paul who said it looks like you're Lana uh. <laughs> you don't remember that? <laughs> One of the biggest moments of my life. He doesn't remember that. Okay. So, what was so, the second biggest moment? Well, the, okay. <laughs> so then anyway, that's, that's how I got the part. Right. So I, I, Tom Cruise, as you said, had done a couple of other movies, but he wasn't the lead in any of those movies. And I was just... I think, uh, he, I think he conned them into thinking that he had a much bigger part in The Outsiders than he did. Uh -huh. like he sort of marched in saying, oh yeah, I'm doing this Coppola film. And, right. but, uh, and um, yeah, I think he kind of... So I, but I had been told by one of our panelists that somebody else was originally going to be cast in his part. And uh, how did he come into it? Uh, and you all felt that obviously he was the perfect person for it. <laughs> when he came in for his first reading, um, he came in late too. Came in we very, had been very casting eight months, uh -huh. somewhere between six and eight months. Okay. Is it still on? Yeah. 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 Okay. We had been casting for a long time, and we had screen tested a couple other actors, and came close, but not. We didn't really, you know, get close enough. And uh, yeah, Tom came in very late, so we had a, a, a lot to. You know, compare him to by that point, and we were pretty confident in in that early reading with him. I think. Well, the early reading was some unlike anything I've ever experienced, because he kept interrupting himself in an audition. He did correct himself right in the middle of yeah. the scene and said, "Wait a minute, I've got Which, another right. take on this. I can do this better." And he he would auto correct and then he would take direction from you and the combination. Which was pretty gutsy for a nineteen year old. Yeah, yeah. and, and also you you you, uh, you were very. Uh, unique in that you looked for a strong collaborator. You wanted someone who had ideas and you weren't intimidated in the least bit by it. On the contrary, you welcomed it. Right. And uh, and he provided that. Uh, and I think that's part of why you, it, it worked out so well. I, I would also like to just say for a second, because we do have a few other actors yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, and, and if I may say, you know, one of the amazing things, we, we met Bronson, I believe, in 
New York and uh, it might have been at the Regency actually, Mary Castle, I can't remember, but, but uh, Bronson, you were in the Whiffin Poofs? Was that the Yale? Yeah, we saw him Bronson on stage. We saw him? Yeah. 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 play about the Whiffin Poofs. Yeah, oh, and, and you were just fantastic on that. And, you know, there, there's something that all these, the, the threes I'm leaving at, uh, Rebecca, all had in common, which is when they came in, their auditions were so singular. Now, some of that might have been in the writing, but all of it ultimately was with the actors. So Bronson just was so smart. Oh, there's our great casting director, Nancy Clapper. Wow. Nancy Clapper. Nancy, Nancy. 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 Uh, and so, so Bronson just blew us away. And then Curtis did something also that was very unusual in our experience, or I'll say in my experiences since I've done more than Paul, which is the reading he did in the audition is exactly the same cadence that he did in the movie. It never changed. It was just fantastic the first time, and then it was fantastic in the movie. Right, Paul? Yeah, it was that kind of slow condescension that he brought to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect for the character. Unlike Raphael, who brought with him a manic laugh that was, uh, <laughs> worked out pretty well. Ask me about Vicky. <laughs> so let me ask the, okay. our other three actors just about their getting involved and how, how you all got along with uh, the two leads and how did everything work from your point of view. Um, I had never done a movie before either. I was a stage actor at the time and had auditioned for a bunch of movies and never gotten cast in them. And um, I assumed the same thing was true with this, especially because it was such a long process. It was like I'd auditioned for it a couple of times and then months would go by and then they'd say, you have a call back for Risky Business. And I would go, what is Risky Business? Because at that point, I'd forgotten. And, um, but uh, we were auditioning together, Bronson and Raphael and me, in that at one point in New York, right? There was a lot of other actors. Yeah. Kept switching everyone yeah, around. but you, you, you are all together. Yeah, but we have, I've got pictures of us that all, the. Oh, you, oh, really? Oh, well, uh, I, uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, and, um, and, uh, and we, we, we just connected, the three of us connected. And then when we got to Chicago and met Tom and Rebecca, it was kind of glorious. And we spent a lot of time in the Lincolnwood Hilton bar. And, and uh, uh, also with Shara, uh, Vicky. Yeah. Yeah, and um, it was just, uh, you know, uh, by the same token, I did think, though, it was a fluke. I, I had been turned down for so many movies that I figured, okay, I'll do this one movie and then that'll be out of my system and I'll go back to working for nothing. <laughs> and, um, but this movie wound up being why I have a career in movies, without question. Deservedly so. I have to do, is, is mine on? I have, I have to do, I, I think of this every single time I audition for anything, and I, I don't think you realize what an effect it had, but I, I, they'd seen me in this little play, and then I went, it was the first audition I ever did for any movie. John was standing in the door, nobody ever does this, they just let somebody else usher you in, but the door opened, the door of the audition room opened, and John was doing this as I walked nervously down the hallway. <laughs> like, this is going to be amazing. And then it was. <laughs> Nobody ever does that. They let you do the dead man walking, and then you go in, and they're just at the end of a fart. And, and then you do, but he was standing in the doorway like, this is going to be the best thing ever. And boom. And I think of it 40 years later, I think of it, I go in, and people are like, who is he? And, but you know, they, they just need to do a John Evnett, and then they would have, they would have great auditions. Seriously, I give it 40 years later. 
it's, um, it's a miracle to be here, and, and it's just wonderful to see your faces. And, and, and Nancy, I'm so glad you're here. Nancy is the casting director for this, and the reason why we're all here. Yeah, I mean, uh, Tom. You were young. I was really young. I literally left high school and came to Chicago. I, I, I had done my last year of high school on a defense study, and I and I left early. And I arrived in Chicago. I had I had no idea what was going. On. Tom and I both had uh, fake IDs and were able to get drinks at the bar, and we played. <laughs> A lot of Pac-Man. I remember a lot of Pac-Man at the bar, uh, and and uh, it was in Skokie. You know, it was not long after the. Anyway, the the the. the ex There's one story I don't know if I've ever told this, but there was a we. Uh, well, I have told this, which is that you know the scene when the Porsche is backing out uh, of the driveway. Uh, John Penn and and Tom were very dear friends. He was doing Bad Boys in Chicago at the time, and and uh, he. Um, uh, we used to hang out, all of us together, and I, he was very, a very intense cat, and uh, uh, he uh, he had gotten a tattoo for the movie, and it was all very, like, and well, anyway, the, the scene where they're driving, pulling the Porsche out, which you're supposed to be in the car, but you weren't that there that day, that's actually, right? Were you in the car when they're pulling out of the driveway? Because I was there that night. It was I, Sean Penn. That was Sean Penn, right. So Sean is in the car as they're pulling out, because I remember being on the set that night. I, 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 I think she actually said that to you. Remember that. I, I thought Bronson was in the car, and Sean was down real low to avoid being seen. But I thought Bronson was in the car. Oh, he was? All right. Very good. Well, I, I do remember but Sean what, being what, on the set that What did happen was the car stored up, stalled out by accident, and Paul wisely said, keep rolling. <laughs> yeah, it was very, very smart. Uh, but by the way, I just have to say, Richard Prince was our second second AD in Thank Chicago. You. Right over there. Yeah. Thank you for being here, Richard. Thank you. Let me ask a question for our casting director, because with a movie like this, with mainly uh, the new faces, the casting director is very important, and I'm sure you played a role in bringing all these people together. Uh, how did you find some of them and uh, put your own uh, recommendations there? Um, let's see. Well, Bronson I saw in this play, the Yale Wolf and Poofs. And uh, Curtis definitely came in in New York, I remember. Raphael, I believe, was LA that you came in the first time? No, Chicago? I was in New York. Oh, you were in New York, too. OK, so you were in New York. Um, and I remember arranging a reading uh, uh, of the script. And you guys all came in and did it. And could have been the movie, you know? Could have shot the movie with that. It was so good. The guys were so good. And um, Rebecca, I don't even know if you know this, but Rebecca I met in LA. The, the way that I came to know you, believe it or not, was I called Harry Dean Stanton. What? Yeah. I knew Harry Dean Stanton um, from casting him in, in another movie. And I called him and said, by any chance, do you know of a great looking, sexy 22 year old actress? And he told me that you had been an extra in One from the Heart. And from that, you came in and you, you read for me. And uh, I think maybe like a week or so later, Helene Shaw called. She was your agent at the time. But anyhow, so you read for me, and then a couple of days later, you came in and read for Paul and John, and then close in time, close to that time, Tom came in and read, and we were now like four to five months into the process. Oh, more than that, Nancy, you worked forever. Forever. Nancy is brilliant. I mean, she did an unbelievable job, and. Obviously, you can see the cast, but it's the amount of time, the effort, yeah. the fact that she never got tired, and she never got, I mean, she was just unstoppable in terms of bringing people in and working with Paul uh, to, to find people. It was, it was really, I, I'd worked with her before, and I knew, I knew she yeah. was good, but she was just unbelievable. I was so young. fortunate. I was really young, <laughs> and that's why I didn't get tired. But, um, so, Everything was 
it took really, really a long time for everything to fall into place. And we did a bunch of screen tests and um, of just the two leads. And uh, at the end of which, I sat in the screening room with Paul and he looked at me and he said, Club, what do you think? I said, I don't think we have them yet. And he said, yeah, well, David Geffen doesn't either. And it was for the two leads, and we didn't, and we're like back to back to square one. And uh, very soon after that, Rebecca came in through Harry Dean, the late, great, very great Harry Dean. And the great actors. And, uh, and then Tom's agent, called and said that he was shooting, um, what was it called? The Outsiders. The Outsiders. The Outsiders. The Outsiders. In, uh, I, it might have been New Mexico or something. Tulsa, 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 Oklahoma. Oklahoma? Oklahoma? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, your memory's better than mine. So he, he, he came in uh, on a day off, and I remember his hair was kind of slicked back as it was in the Outsiders, and I think he had a, maybe a gold tooth. No, he had a chip tooth. A chip, a chip, chip tooth. tooth, okay. I knew something with the tooth. And um, even though he physically was not, what, you know, he was so not Joel Goodson, we all looked at each other as soon as he left the room with a great sigh of relief, I think, a great sigh. And then we made arrangements for him to come back. He took a red eye in and um, read I in from location, and he and Rebecca uh, came to Steve Tish's house at about 5.30, 6.30 in the morning, and instead of these big fancy screen tests, it was just on a handheld little Sony video cam. Am I right? Yeah, with yeah. the old Viticon elements for those of you who use them. Yeah. 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 And that was it. So uh, this movie, you know, I, I think people have actu actually um, spoken about this and written about it, that, you know, this was a, very much an R-rated comedy of, that was popular in that era, and you rarely see those movies made anymore today. Uh, and I wonder what your thought is as to why that all changed. I mean, the, there were a lot of successful ones, I guess, in the 80s and the 90s, and it's a genre that's uh, kind of gone out of fashion. What's the question? Well, it was the height of civilization, so. <laughs> I think that's very clear. We've devolved. <laughs> I, I think it's you know it's very difficult today to have the kind of uh, freewheeling humor, and uh, and even when you look at the sexuality in the film, it was both you know somewhat explicit and at the same time it was not uh, gratuitous uh, or exploitative. And and by the way, part of that was just how Rebecca and Tom worked. You know, uh, Paul had these really strong images. You know, frames, uh, but it was how they worked, and uh, yeah, but, 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 yeah, 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 really, yeah, exactly. No, I think uh, the bulk of it was the way Paul saw it in his mind, and that he, Paul, played the um, the Phil Collins song in the air tonight in the garage of the casting building. Um, right after I was cast. He knew that song months in advance, and that gave the tone already of a kind of a, a melancholy, wistful, sad, there was something sad and something aching um, in that song. And by the way, you thought the lyric was, I feel like coming in the air tonight, yeah. hold on. Yeah. But it's not, it was what I said. <laughs> I feel like coming in the air tonight, oh Lord. 
it is oh lord you kept telling me during the thing it is because i saw the lyric sheet it is it's coming out of the movie now <laughs> No, but but I, I realized in, in making in, in the way that Paul divides those love scenes are are you know the, the there was just some, there's something beautiful about nudity about passion that was not exploitative and that I felt from how he directed and. It, Combined with that, I really wanted to bring a nobility and a dignity to a person that, you know, most people would think she didn't have that. Why don't you talk about how you saw the character, you know, from what you read? Well, how I saw the character. Well, first of all, her name was Lana, which I believe, I always look up the root of names, and Lana means to float, I believe, in Norwegian or some Scandinavian thing. So I was like, oh, so she can always float. Either I made it up or you said it that her last name was Sharf. Did you say that? Yeah. yeah. Which is means sharp as a knife, right? Sharf is sharp in German is sharp as a knife. So she floats and she's sharp as a knife. That's how I started. And that's all you needed. <laughs> no, but I did more. <laughs> no, but um, yeah, I saw her as the soul of the film. I, of, you know, the, the film was a perfectly constructed um, you know, funny, tight, coming of age story, but on another level, it completely functioned as a kind of what I saw as a meditation on the cost of succeeding within capitalism. And you know, it's it's quite clear that's what it is. But I thought I was very smart figuring that out at the time. Um, but but it it was about that and. You know, Lana represents the underdog, the person that we really see shows the cost of, of what it costs um, when you're, you know, you don't come from the cushioned uh, home of, of, of a Joel Goodson, who, like, how does capitalism work? You know, Lana kind of was in the cog of the machine, and, you know, Joel was kind of, you know, it, it's in certain sectors, it's handed to you. Mentioned the lost line from the, the lost scene at the end. What was the lost line of the line? They, they took out a key line at the end. What was it? It was why does it always have to be so tough? Oh, yeah, was, right. Was very and emotional the, reading from you, and they, they took it out. Yeah, it, in in the last scene, in the in the in the breakfast had, scene. Yeah. yeah. Paul had a different ending, which we actually screened at the thirty year anniversary. And unfortunately, this was the ending that was in the theaters on the early DVDs. The 30-year DVD and the 40-year DVD has the ending that Paul wanted. And it was a very uh, uh, unfortunate uh, uh, fight uh, over the film because it had a lot to do with the meaning as you had constructed it. And so in the moment he's talking about, which was in the original version and in the last version of the DVD, Lana has one moment of vulnerability or even sentimentality, you know, when she says, why does it have to be so tough? And then Tom says, come here. She walks halfway. That's right. I, I, yeah. I don't go right. over there and then anymore. She, you you end up sitting That's on his lap still, but I with, did. with all these commuters coming in yeah. at 5.30 or 6 in the morning from Outer Drive. And, you know, it was this one moment of vulnerability and the sense that what you're talking about, which is the price of your life versus these future enterprises who are entering this Reagan world. Handed it for me. And, and you know, it's just, it's, it was Paul's view. You, you should speak there. But yeah, the, the original ending. John, you articulated that very well. <laughs> the original ending, he didn't get into Princeton. He did not get into Princeton. And um, that was the, the statement that Paul was making of when he, yeah, you can obviously say that, but but we screened it, and the audiences wanted Joel to get into Princeton. <laughs> they did not want him going under because of what happened. And so that was an ending that Paul really, really, really didn't want to do. Right. But 
How do you it feel seems now? to have worked. <laughs> you say so. Well, everybody seems to think so. I think. I mean, I prefer that that ending, the the original, for sure. But everything happens for a reason, I guess. Somehow. So I mean, how was the studio? As you said, they had, at the beginning had no faith in this, and then it turned out to be a huge success. Um, <laughs> what uh, I know that, and people often take credit for it after the fact, uh, even though they didn't want to, to do it. But how did it change all of your lives, the success of the movie? I got out of town. <laughs> <laughs> how about you? Yeah. Um, uh, Paul, uh, a few years ago, came and visited me in my house in Los Angeles. Um, he had never been there before. I visited him in his home several times. And he came and visited, and he walked around looking at it. And he said, so, so this is the house I bought you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think, you know, we we always thought this was a good movie. Uh, and uh, we thought it had the potential to be something uh, that had a, a comment on the world we were in, because many of you look like you might have been around during those years. It, it was pretty tough, you know, when Reagan became the president. He was very optimistic, but the country was in the dumps. And, and you know, in a... <coughs> freewheeling capitalism was unleashed in our world and on the world. And, uh, and, and Paul and I hoped or aspired, as you can do when you're young filmmakers, about making that generation's graduate, the film that affected and impacted us enormously. Because back in that time when <clears throat> the word plastics was mentioned, everybody went, oh, that's fake, that's, you know, everything is wrong with the world. And our view in in this time period, 82, 83, was if someone said plastics, where do I sign? You know, right. and so in Tom says, do you want to serve fellow mankind? Of course, he's not saying it totally seriously, but they're throwing French fries at him. And, and then you have got the little, you know, the future enterprisers, and that ending that Paul wrote and the way he visualized it, I thought was just fantastic. Uh, and then you've got the real capitalist, the person who's struggling for you know, her life and their consequences there. And then you've got David Geffen. <laughs> that's a capitalist. Now that's capitalism. <laughs> but he's also the one who saw this movie, and he, that's and, true. And, and to his credit, yeah. he did it other than the fight at the end. You know, he really supported it, and he bullied Warners around. And it just shows you that there was something to this person early on in his film career. His record career had already been very well established, where he saw what Paul wrote. Maybe not 100%, maybe 90%, maybe 85 maybe it was slightly different, but he really did get it. And we, I'm saying we, all of us in the audience, we need people who get it. We need people who take chances. We need people who say, he's not just a writer, he's a writer-director. We need people, you know, luckily we have the independent world, which many of the films come here, you know, and people get a chance to do that. But we also need it in people who want to make a career out of making films, a career out of not just entertaining, but uh, asking questions that are relevant to you, provoking you, making you think, making you debate, making you perhaps change your mind, making you be a little more optimistic, you know, challenging you. And that's what, what he did in allowing this and, and a couple of other movies he did. Uh, but it was very fortunate for us, and uh, you know, Paul's direction went one way, mine went in another. You know, it was you know a great stepping stone uh, for for me, and, and the most important thing for me is Paul became my best friend, and that was worth everything. Oh. Oh. Um, just time for maybe a couple questions from the audience. Uh, yes, go ahead. First of all. Really, thank you so much. This has always been one of my. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be at the Lemley Theater and to see all you creative people. Risky Business has always been one of my favorite films, and 
I must say, earlier today I went to see Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible and came over here. Ah. <laughs> it was really great. So I guess I'm feeling my age. I wonder if it's not inappropriate. I wanted to ask you what you think about the how it's going to go with the writer's strike. Is there <laughs> a, at midnight tonight something's going to go on? Because it's really, that's where it all begins. And with the Screen Actors Guild right here at midnight, that's the, the huge part. What is going to happen and how are we going to support it? And I just thought, uh, if it's not inappropriate, I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, for those who don't know, I've been, uh, I was having negotiations with the Directors Guild of America. And uh, this is where Richard and I work together. Uh, you know, it, it, the world's changed. It's an ugly world. You know, it's very difficult to agree on basic principles. And, and the business of the film business is so different from when we started out. Uh, and it's changed, and it is changing. And so uh, if you add to that uh, the, the fact that you have something that is going to be a large technological shift, and people don't deal well with change. And you know, so what is AI, what's GAI going to mean? Who, who can really answer? Will it have an impact on our world? Yes. So it is in the context of that, in the context of changing business models, <coughs> that it's become very complicated to come to a resolution in these uh, collective bargaining agreements. It's very, very unfortunate on one level because it hurts everybody. Uh, and, and particularly the people who need the work the most and the people who support the film business. Uh, so when you have these stoppages, it's very tough. At the same time, you know, we're nowhere without writers. There's nothing without writing. <laughs> and the writers should and must get a fair deal. And the same thing with the actors. You know, they, they, they you know, we were talking about this right before, which is they, they need to be paid and not be exploited. Their images can't be exploited against, without their, in my opinion, their consent. So these are tough issues. There have been tough issues before. It's just the world, I think, is a little uglier. There's a little less trust. Unfortunately, the line that Paul wrote doesn't seem to get the laugh that I thought it should get, which is if there were any logic to our language, trust would be a four-letter word. <laughs> Uh, it seems more applicable today than you know 40 years ago. So, so it's uh, unfortunate. The, uh, the, uh, uh, a question about Tom Cruise makes me think. Of course, yes, he has this huge movie that's opening today. That's going to be an enormous blockbuster. And you know, he's managed to have this blockbuster career for all these years. But for actresses, I don't think it has been so easy to sustain a career for that period of time and get the same attention and the same breaks. Uh, how did you deal with all that? Uh, you know, looking at uh, how things went for him and, and uh, your own uh, sort of uh, journey during that same time. Well, I was just gonna say, I feel, um, is this working? Is this working? How's this? This is a better one. Um, I really feel uh, a lot of regret that I didn't start, you know, jumping out of airplanes early on. <laughs> I, I really think I should have started doing that, you know, or even jumping off of cliffs, you know, parachuting. Um, uh, look, <laughs> it, is a, it is a tough thing to be a woman in, in any business. Okay, it's just there is no real true equality and every woman will nod her head. It's that's the way it is so far. Um, we, we, things are changing. Um, so there's nothing really to say about that except for uh, you, you do the best you can, uh, you know, in any way you can. And I feel that, um, yeah, and ageism is a thing obviously, and it's ageism in Hollywood, but it's ageism everywhere. I mean, you know, in every profession. So I think that I've been incredibly lucky. Uh, I've been incredibly blessed. Uh, 
And it all started with this film. That's why I'm just so, um, I, I have just so much love in my heart for this film uh, on so many levels, but, but also it taught me something about um, what makes a great film, which is, it is when, well, first of all, obviously you need a really good script and a, yeah. and a really good director, uh, which helps. Um, but, but I think everybody, the key people, like the producer, the director, the cinematographer, the actors, on set, that they're all dreaming the same dream. And I really felt that on this film. I mean, the film, the finished film, weirdly, is not that different from what I saw in my head. I mean, it's, it's more beautifully shot, um, so I wouldn't know how to think that, but it is, it is the sensibility, it is the film that, that I saw. And I had that feeling, just like what you had about John, that when John, it's like they say as an actor that if you, you don't, if you're going to play the king, you don't act like a king. You let the other actors around you treat you like a king. And then that's how the audience gets that you're a king. You know, and I felt that the job that I did, John and Paul, like, really looked at me as if I really was it. Like, I was really going to bring it just like what you said. And I felt that coming through. And um, it, it made me more confident. But in any case, uh, that's just, I'm digressing. I, um, the, the business is tough, and it doesn't really serve me or anyone to sort of dwell on, you know, how tough it is. Just sort of get on with it. That's all I'm saying. Well, I would say one thing. You know, one of the results of this was, I, mean, I always wanted to direct. I learned an awful lot as a producer working with directors. No, no situation more than working with Paul over and over again. Uh, and you know, the first film I directed was Five Women Starring, it was Fried Green Tomatoes, you know, with Jessica Candy and Kathy Bates, you know. And, uh, you know, and I'm just a cis male, you know. Uh, so, so, you know, but I think there has been some progress you know, it, with all the things that I'm critical of in terms of at least one first acknowledging the lack of diversity in terms of roles for women, roles for people of color. Uh, and I think that's, there's been some real progress. And, it, and we, we look at it in the Guild very carefully, like directors, you know, how many women directors, and the opportunities, and, and, and how many people of color. So there, there has been progress there. It just feels like, it feels like there's a weight, you know, on the business in terms of getting fresh voices and giving them an opportunity to not only make a movie, but to have a career. And that's, again, part of these questions right now about work. Can you yeah, have a so career you. in this business? You had a question. I would like to add that, um, in fact, Rebecca, after Kissy Business, had a very, she was hotter than hot. She didn't have the rock and the cradle. Rock's Okay. And so she took time off for that reason, and then you know her children are grown now, and uh, she's she's inspired to what life. I'll get the gun in. Do you want to add anything to that, Rebecca? Uh, yeah, like I I said in this interview that came out that is is great in rap today. Um, I just find it very hard to multitask. And when I became a mother, I just really became devoted to that. It wasn't really a conscious decision, um, but I love my daughters. And, um, but, but I, you know, I love movie making, so. That's great, so. Yeah, just, uh, I, we have to go ahead, one more, yeah, go ahead. about whether this was, uh, I, I said it was a brilliant film because it seems like a capitalist film. It seems like a Porky's in some ways, but it's not those things at all. It's anti those things. And I think it comes down to the tone you achieve in the acting. I mean, it's, it's funny at times, but it, it plays against the humor often. He 
be doing it right. Mm -hmm. Or in place, and that's that kind of well, life graduate does to some extent that kind of weird, uh, I, I, I don't even know it's how to say it. Tone poem. Huh? A tone poem. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and, uh, I, I was wondering if, like, how much of that was uh, as you were making it, or if that was your vision all along, because it's a, <coughs> it's a really great juxtaposition between the sound and the humor, but then the kind of melancholy that I think Rebecca's character I, I agree. That's yeah. the heart of it. And also, like, I don't like Tom Cruise's character very much you in a weird way. I, I like him, but I don't like him, right? So there's a weird tone there in terms I of. Like uh, <laughs> 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 so I, I just wonder if that, that was in the process as you were developing, or okay. I okay. Yeah. I, I, the tone was the in intention before I had the plot. I wanted to do a mix of humor and, and, and a certain darkness with theme underlying it. And to see if you mixed in real sexuality with those other two elements, where would you come out? And it was an experiment. We didn't always know what would trump what. Whether, you know, you wouldn't get a laugh because of something or, you know. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, when Rebecca makes her entrance, and it's a you know a very kind of heightened moment, and she says, "Are you ready for me, Ralph?" <laughs> we didn't know whether that was you know it's a funny line, but what would trump what with the with the heightened sexuality of the moment, you know, take over, and you wouldn't get the laugh, or would you get the laugh? Would you? And that was throughout the film, um, and it was an experiment. We I, I didn't know. I just know. From my point of view, I wanted to make the film that I would, that I wanted to take a date to in high school, but didn't exist. <laughs> that was kind of basically, while I could still do that, because I was young when I made the film. Um, yeah, I wanted to do the film that didn't exist, and it was that mix of tone uh, that made it uh, apart from other films for young people that were being done at the time. You talked about um, Happy New Year, the French film. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Claude Lelouch film. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we did? Yeah, 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 you, yeah we you did. You mentioned that as, a, uh, again, along with the Phil Collins song, you mentioned that before we started shooting that you wanted this sort of bittersweetness of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there's a bittersweetness. And also visually, I thought, you know, typically films for kids were just uh, like lit really brightly and terribly and whatnot. And I said, you know, to John, John and I both were big fans of Bertolucci's The Conformist. And I thought, what if you had a film with humor for young people that looked like The Conformist? What would that be, <laughs> you know? And, you know, we didn't always hit that mark, but that's what we were shooting for. Yeah. Yeah. One, one more well, thing, which is, you, you formed the, the idea of uh, visually what an 80s film looks like. When people are making films like Drive now, or, uh, or Bridget Goes, uh, Goes West, they look like your film in, in just the visuals. And I think that's a, that's a tribute to you, not because all of you, that uh, that's still there. And I think, I don't know if you're seeing that when you see these films, but it's just yeah, so nostalgic. I, yeah, I never thought of that, but um, you know, the, the, again, it was the mix of tone that you picked up on, which was my intention from the beginning. And, and yeah, from my vantage point, Paul's I mean, there are these little touches, just the door. You know, it's like my own movie to a certain extent. You feel like an idiot saying it, but I mean, it's like the three kids, the little kids watching when they come. You know, these little things that Paul does that I just go, they're just, but they're just delightful. They're little, like, little cookies, little candies for the audience. You know what I mean? And at the same time, you, know, you get an increasing sense, not with the ending exactly as it was released, you know, of a, a, a quiet desperation on the part of Rebecca's character. And that's why that line on her part, is, does it always have to be this tough? Yeah. You know, it was sort of like this one moment of acknowledgement. I mean, you saw it in the defensiveness when, you know, she's talking about her brother. You know what I mean? I'm not my brother, you know? Uh, but it, 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 I just think the writing and that, that tonal dance that Paul does so well. I've directed stuff Paul's written. Some of it is pretty funny. And I often think Paul would have done a better job directing it than I would have, just because his sense of timing and tone is so idiosyncratically tuned 
to, to a very, very fine pitch. And, and you know, there are, there, there are not as many filmmakers who do that now. And the ones who do, I, I love, just like you know, Billy Wilder, or, you know, Mike Nichols, you know, many of the people back then, Jim Brooks, you know, there are a number of them who would deal with things that would be called bittersweet, you know, whether it's Terms of Endearment, Broadcast News, or whatever, if you're looking at Brooks. You know, that's something Paul does in a different way, but it has a similar way of seducing you into the character, seducing you into the dramatic situation, and then allowing you a way out, and then seducing you back in, perhaps in a deeper way. And I, I, I like that kind of filmmaking. Well, anyway, thank you all. Thank you to the audience, and just the audience as well. Uh, really